It doesn't matter if I'm making an electric go-kart with my kids or even building an insanely powerful bat swinging machine. Oh my. There's one question I have to answer over and over again in my projects. What size motor do I need to get the job done? Now, there are many parameters that go into selecting the right type of motor. Today, we're gonna to be focused on how much power do you need? It doesn't matter if you're buying a motor off the shelf or you've pulled a motor out of an old broken appliance. Somewhere on that motor is gonna be a power rating. And that number is really important because it tells you how much work the motor can do and it tells you how quickly the motor can do the work. To illustrate this, I've subpoenaed my kids to move some bricks for me. To calculate the power output of my kids, we need to know three things. How much force they're applying to the bricks, how far they move the bricks, and how long it took for them to move the bricks. Put all those numbers in the formula and you get power. In this case, if I'm not satisfied with the power output, I can always input some motivation to get better results. Good stuff. Yes, yes. But something interesting happens when you go from moving in a straight line to moving in a circle. In fact, if I take these two pulleys to do some work, it matters a great deal which one I put on the motor. To illustrate that, we're gonna use a seesaw. Many of us have experienced the sensation of sitting on a seesaw with someone whose weight doesn't equal ours. Even kids, without thinking about it, intuitively adjust their position on the seesaw to try to balance out their weights. What you're actually doing is balancing out the torques. Torque is a combination of the force you're applying, in this case your body weight, multiplied by the length of your lever, or the distance to the center of rotation. These two variables are equally important. In this example, you can see we've got twice the weight on one side being balanced out by a lever that's twice as long. Now I want you to think of this pulley as a lever, with the length of the lever being the radius of the circle here. The motor has a fixed amount of torque that it can put out. And just like we saw in the example with the seesaw, if you increase the length of the lever on one side, you're gonna to need to decrease the force in order for them to be equal. So using different size pulleys will give you different amounts of force output. But there's an interesting trade-off. Because the arc length here is much greater on this one, I've given up some force, but I've increased in speed. In fact, they're directly proportional. Putting this one on the motor will give me a lower speed, but more force output. Putting this one on the motor will give me a much higher speed, but a lot less force. Now that we have that foundation, let's take a closer look at the power formula. Here in the US, the horsepower is the customary unit, but I'll be happy to show you watts on the screen here as well, since pretty much everyone else in the world uses that. We're simply multiplying torque times speed and dividing it by a constant. You can also back calculate whatever variables you need. Let's take this motor for example. We have both the horsepower and the speed, but we wanna figure out how much torque this motor has. We can rearrange this formula a little bit and you can calculate how much torque the motor's producing at that speed. There's one more scenario I wanna mention and that is, what if you have a motor with a power rating on it, but there's no speed? Under those circumstances, you're gonna to need to get an RPM gauge and actually measure the speed of the motor. Armed with that knowledge, we can get to work. For this first example, let's look at how I selected motors to automate my table saw. To size the motors here, there are two basic questions we need to answer. One, how much torque does it take to rotate this handle? And two, how fast do I wanna rotate the handle? Let's start with speed. That's something that's entirely made up by you, right? I could have this go from 45 degrees to zero degrees in a fraction of a second. That would be ultra fast spinning of the handle and would require a lot more power. Of course, you can select the speed however you like, but I decided completely arbitrarily to have the speed be about 50% faster than what it would be if I was rotating it by hand. I figured that out by counting the number of rotations it takes to go from one extreme to the other, and then I timed myself going from one extreme to the other. Putting those two together will give you the RPM that you desire. Now let's take a look at the torque requirements. For that, you're gonna need a scale. So I bought this on Amazon, but any old fish scale will do. We've gotta set the pounds, and you're gonna hook this on. There we go. And then pull on it. Now there's a couple things to think about. You don't want it to be down like this. I mean, this scale doesn't weigh very much, but in this orientation, you are technically also including the weight of the scale, and we don't want that. The scale needs to be tangent to the circle that you're pulling. Another way to think of that would be if you drew a straight line from the center of the wheel to the center of the handle, you want your scale to be perpendicular to that line you just drew. We're gonna clear the scale out, make sure it's at zero, and then you're gonna start pulling. Four, one, four, two, there we go. So we're gonna say about 4.2 pounds to get the handle to start to rotate. Once the handle starts moving, the force required to move it will go down a little bit, 
you're primarily interested in that initial peak number. What's the highest amount of force required to get it going from a dead stop? So now we know the force required. We just need to measure the distance at which that force is being applied. So I'm gonna measure from the center of the handle to the center of the wheel, which is 45 millimeters. Well, that gives us all the raw data. We've got our RPM, our torque, so now we can calculate power and we can select a motor. Here's the formula for kilowatts as well as horsepower. And the first thing I want you to do is pay attention to your units. Make sure if you measured in centimeters, for example, that you convert that to meters and kilograms and newtons are not equal. So I'm gonna make up some numbers cause I don't actually remember what I just measured in the shop. Let's say I want 100 RPM and we need a torque, which includes 0.1 feet multiplied by three pounds. We're gonna divide that by 5252. So in this totally made up example, the horsepower requirements are quite small, but we're not done. We need to add something called a safety factor. Safety factor is a margin that we add to the number we calculated in order to account for temporary overloads of the motor and a few other things. Now, safety factor can be a really deep well. In fact, it's related to another number found on many motor labels called service factor but I'm gonna put a pin in both of those topics for now and I'll come back to that at the end of the video. In this particular case, because we're selecting a stepper motor, I'm gonna use a safety factor of two, but that's pretty high for most other motor types. So again, we'll come back to that a little bit later. Now that we have our safety factor, let's multiply that by the horsepower we calculated a minute ago. 0 0.0114 or about eight watts. In terms of how much power we need, this is it. All we need to do now is go and select a motor that matches these power and speed requirements. With stepper motors though, I wanna go one step further regarding the power, because most of the time with the specs that you get from a stepper motor show you what's called pullout torque. So let's look at a chart from one of the motors I'm using on my CNC table saw to explain what I mean. I want you to notice a couple things. First, it says this is pullout torque. This is basically the torque where your performance starts to drop. The motor is gonna to start to lose steps. So we don't wanna be at that limit. The other thing I want you to notice is that the units are in Newton centimeters. The final thing I want you to notice is that as the speed increases, the torque goes down. We know we're looking for something a little over 40. We're just gonna say just barely under 50 Newton centimeters. And we're at 100 RPM. So that definitely puts us in a safe margin here. And you can see that even if we increase the speed quite a bit, we're still way down in a very safe zone. But let's say we needed more torque than that. Let's say that we were up around 200 Newton centimeters and the speed was also higher at about 330. In this situation, there's a couple things to consider. One, you've already added a safety factor. So technically this should still work. If it was me, I would still try to inch away from that line a little bit, but I'd also be weighing that against things like, is this a motor I already have? Am I buying a new one anyway? And how much difference is the cost if I get one that's just a little bit bigger? So I have to leave those details up to you. But what about examples where you don't know all the loads in advance? In this particular case, when I was building my bandsaw or even my disc sander, I didn't just need to know the power to move the disc or the blade in this case, I needed to know how much power it takes to actually saw the wood or saw steel, which is also something I wanted to be able to do on this bandsaw. In those particular cases, I use what I call the experience method. I simply look at what other manufacturers have done in similar applications, like looking at disc sanders, or in this case, looking at bandsaws, or even steel cutting bandsaws, to get an idea of how much power they've decided they need in order for their machine to work properly. And then that gives you a really good starting point. Now you might be tempted to add a safety factor to that, but keep in mind that they've probably already added a safety factor. So unless you know that tool to be underpowered for your particular applications, I probably wouldn't add a safety factor to that number. I kind of feel like this goes without saying, but you could also just simply experiment through trial and error, which is what I did with this miter saw build here. But there's a whole video dedicated to this project. So if you want to know more about what happened with this build, you can click on the link in the description. What I've shown you so far are the easiest methods for getting through most DIY projects. If that wasn't quite sufficient for you, that means you're gonna to need to do a little bit more math. Now, there are lots of formulas online available for calculating what's called rotational inertia. It's basically a measurement of how difficult it is to get something to rotate. Under those circumstances, you'll figure that out for each part of your system, add them together, and that'll allow you to calculate how much force is needed to get everything spinning. That information is available in the description and I'll also put some more video links down there for you. Okay, I wanna be the first to admit 
There are a whole bunch of other topics that need to be covered along with this one when it comes to selecting a motor. For example, what kind of duty cycle do you need? Is this thing gonna be running 24 hours a day or is it gonna be running for five minutes at a time? So that's duty cycle. Number two, what's the environment like? Is it super hot, super cold? Is your motor gonna be underwater? All of those affect what type of motor you select and what type of enclosure you select. Do you need speed control for your motor? That's gonna affect what type of motor you select. Does your motor need to be mobile? In other words, does it need to be powered by a battery? In those circumstances, you're gonna need either special controls or it's gonna to need to be a DC motor. And what about all those other numbers that we see on the motor's label like service factor? What do those things mean and which ones matter to my situation? Fortunately for you, I've covered a lot of these in previous videos. So instead of making this one an hour and a half long, I'm gonna put links in the description so that you can go to those other videos and fill in some of those details. Thanks for watching.